Appreciate everybody showing up. How are you guys enjoying the conference so far? Yeah, a lot of great, great content. I haven't been able to get to any sessions yet, so hopefully after this, I'm going to at least see one or two, and then uh, especially tomorrow. But. All right, so what we're talking about today, the title, Empowering IT Teams Safely and Effectively with System Frontier 2.0. All right, so what does that mean? So there's, there's things the IT admin never wants to hear, you know? We just take calls and forward the tickets like your help desk, service desk. Uh, I always call so-and-so so they can run a script to fix something, right? So you're the Mac truck. Uh, just make me a local administrator. That always fixes everything. Or just put them in domain admins group, right? So what ends up happening a lot of times in a lot of organizations, uh, people need certain levels of access to just do a few things. Uh, everybody's busy, so they throw them in admin group, give them some level of admin privs, and call it a day. Uh, we want to try to fix that. So what you're going to learn out of this session is one way, there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but one way to empower your service desk and other teams, level one support folks, application support, support teams, uh, with PowerShell tools, right? So be able to easily turn your PowerShell scripts into web-based tools, um, control who can run those tools and where. Um, users won't need to have admin rights with this solution, right? Uh, which is super important. And then issues are going to get resolved faster, which means you and your team are going to be able to have more time to do things that you're getting paid to do versus, you know, the, the mundane daily, you know, tickets that come in, all right? All right, just quick about me. I've been in IT for a long time. I'm kind of an old head. Uh, started out in batch files, MS-DOS, did a ton of VB script. Uh, nobody wants to talk about that anymore. And uh, now I do PowerShell, also .NET development. Uh, created System Frontier back in 2012, so we've been doing this for 10 years. You probably never heard of us because we suck at marketing. Um, and you can pull me up on Twitter uh, at OneScripter. All right, so I hate slides, uh, but I got one more. So uh, we've, like I said, we've been in business for 10 years, been iterating the product for a long time, but uh, when you look at the UI compared to other similar solutions out there, it's really aged, uh, you know, not too well over the years. So today we're announcing a brand new version of System Frontier 2.0, uh, completely redesigned from the ground up. Uh, you can create, you know, modern web uh, UIs with PowerShell. You don't have to use any HTML, JavaScript, WIM forms, WPF, anything like that. Uh, you can do HTML and JavaScript if you want to, but it's not like a requirement to, to build the UIs. Uh, it's focused on simplicity uh, for the admins, you know, sysadmins, as well as the end users that you're delegating tools to. Um, every tool includes uh, role-based access control, uh, REST API, uh, parallel execution job engine, so you can run scripts across. You remember in the keynote they talked about, you know, for each parallel, kind of the same concept where you can execute scripts across tons of targets uh, and do it in parallel, but your script doesn't have to have any code like that in it. Uh, and then you automatically get logging uh, is included for, you know, for every tool. Uh, and then we got, uh, same with the current edition that we are, the current version that we have out now, there's a free community edition that you can get started with. No, you know, credit cards or spam or anything like that. Just download it, start kicking the tires on it, and, you know, see if it works for you. So, like I said, I hate slides. I'm sure you guys too, so it's demo time. Hopefully nothing uh, blows up, so... <laughs> Yeah, it's already blowing up. All right. No memento. All right. So this is the new 2.0 interface for System Frontier. And so just to kind of give you cut to the chase and show you what, like, a tool would look like in System Frontier that you would, like, give to somebody to run. So, like, we've got this basic test tool. So I run that. It's going to load up. Uh, you know, basic user interface. Uh, you know, we've got text box, drop down list, uh, we can have file upload parameters. Any, pretty much any HTML field that's out there, plus a few custom things that we have for, we go with the HDMI, plus a few custom uh, fields that we have specific to System Frontier. You can use those to build your tools. So here I could uh, put in 
like a server name or workstation. This could also be targeting, you know, user accounts, uh, switches, routers, you know, pretty much any device that has an API. Uh, I could do something like here. I've got a, a predefined list uh, of things I could choose from. So I'll hit processes. And you'll notice right below it, the other dropdown just popped up, automatically got populated based off of the selection I, I did in the first dropdown. So that's just a basic like cascading style sheet that you, you know, normally would write some JavaScript or use, you know, whatever your favorite um, client side framework is to build that. Here, this is all just PowerShell based. I, I didn't have to write any, any JavaScript or HTML to do that. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Love it. Yeah. All right, so and if I run that, it's going to get executed by the job engine and then we expand the results. And we're going to see just straight, raw, you know, PowerShell output like you would get from the, the console. Um, so by default, that's the way it works. But you can also expand that output or enhance that output, rather, with HTML, do other things to make it look pretty for the, the target user or whoever your audience is. So let's look at, behind the scenes, what it takes to, like, create a tool like that. So... Just go new. We'll create like another create AD user tool. Um, standard tools in development. Here I would go over to files, and there's a couple ways you could do this. Um, for demo purposes, I'll just be creating um, a script here. We'll just call it uh, main.ps1. Um, and I think I've already got just a little bit of demo code here. We'll pop in there so you don't have to watch me type forever. Um, so this is just like super simple standard PowerShell script. I've got my command line parameters. Um, this is all like just a little bit of pseudo code, nothing actually doing anything out in AD or Office 365 or whatever you'd be targeting. But we're going to want to take like a username, a job title, uh, email address, maybe set up some default groups. Maybe uh, you might want to have a checkbox to assign Office 365 licenses or, you know, whatever the case may be. So we've got these, like I said, these, um, what, five different parameters. So I'm going to go over to the design surface. Now, in this demo version, because this is still an early beta, we don't have the option to dynamically build the, the UI elements from the script parameters. That'll be in the production release. Uh, we're doing a private beta starting next month, and then we'll, we'll have it in there by then. Uh, but so here, I would, I'm just going to go through. And so you can see on the left, I've got all these different types of uh, form fields that I can use to design my, my tool. So I'm going to start with a text box, uh, double click on it to add it to the design surface. Um, it's got a default name. I could give it a label. So you know, we'll call this uh, maybe username. I think in my script, it was actually called user ID. Um, and then, let's see, let's go back over to the script. So I had job title, SMTP address. So maybe um, job title, maybe let's say I want to do like, I don't know, a list box. Because uh, I don't want the user to type in the, all right. Now, I could start out, so over on the left, I've got that list box one. So we'll, we'll rename it to uh, job title. Now. One thing to notice, the, the name property here, that's what's matching up to my command line parameter. So as long as that name matches your command line parameter, whatever the user puts in there or selects, that's going to get passed over to the script when it gets executed. But you can, like I said, give it a different label. So I could say, you know, job space title for the label. Now, uh, there's this data source property. So there's two ways to populate this in your form. So let's say it's something really simple, basic. You could just put like a static list in there, which we'll start out with. So maybe I, we have like uh, accountant and then, um, you know, secretary or something. We'll say uh, tech analyst one. All right. You could also set up like a default value. So let's say you got a form uh, for like this create AD user and like there's maybe five pieces of the, or five elements of the form that always are, you know, nine times out of ten the same value. You could set a default value for that so the user can like have less clicks to go through when they're uh, running this tool. Uh, and there's a few other properties here, uh, but we'll, we'll stick with those for now. 
Let's see. And then uh, I think the next one was SMTP address. So I'll add another text field down here. Uh, we'll call it SMTP address. Uh, and then we'll just we'll show the user email. And then what was the next one? Uh, default groups and org unit. All right. So deep. So if you notice, default groups, um, we got a string array, right? So maybe we want to set them up with multiple default groups, so we want to pass an array to set them up in the AD. So for that, um, we could do, do it a couple ways. Uh, I think I'm going to go for a checkbox or a set of checkboxes. And we'll call that default groups. And then same thing here in the data source, I could manually stick some values in here. Let's say, uh, you know, um, I want to put somebody in like a internet access group. Uh, maybe they're a print user and uh, I don't know, uh, finance. Okay. And then uh, the last one was the org unit. So we'll just do a text box for that one real quick. All right. <clears throat> so let's let's save this and just take a, a quick look, make sure everything looks okay. So this, here's our create AD user two. Let's run that. This is that bomb GIF I was showing. I'll give it a second here. Yep. So that's the nuclear bomb GIF. All right. Let's, let's try that again. Yep. Nuclear bomb. All right. Sorry about that. Give me one second. Like I said, this is an early beta, so I apologize. Uh, well, I already know it's a software break. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, the, the demo's going great so far. All right. Let me try, uh, see if we can load up that test tool I had in there. <laughs> oh man, okay. All right, so I can show you the same, the same concept, so I'm sure there's something broke with that, one of those, those fields that I just added in that other tool, so we still got some work to do on that, but. Um, so just to show you how some of this works, like stuff that you can do with it. Like I said, no, no JavaScript, no HTML that you have to do, all PowerShell. So like if you remember on this uh, basic test tool I was showing, I had this drop down. You know, I could select like some uh, values. And even this one isn't working because I'm seeing these static values in here. So we're, we're really in some trouble. Um, so if, we, if I go back and look at the configuration for this one, Man, this is awesome. Okay. All right, so like I was trying to say a second ago, um, so like we have these two drop downs on this test tool and I did the like cascading drop down effect. I selected a value in one drop down and then automatically populated the next one. So we've got like an event model in the new version where let's say here I talked about having those static data source values. Well, you can also populate stuff with events. And so the, at a, and they're at two levels. So events happen at the tool level and then also at the custom field level. So at the tool level, if I go over to the events tab, there's this on initialize event, right? So what this does is uh, you can run uh, PowerShell snippet, and, and we support more than just PowerShell. It could be, you know, Python or other languages. Most of our, almost all of our examples, 
uh, focus on PowerShell because that's the, what works the best with the product. Um, but again, we're not limited to PowerShell. So this on initialize uh, script here, this is just another tool, right? So I can go over and we'll pull up that on initialize script, edit it, go to files, and then look at the actual script code. So here I can, I can edit the script in the browser, we'll switch it to full screen. Um, and so what's going on here is we've got this automatic, uh, basically like an automatic uh, variable that's exposed to every tool called data bus. Right? And on the data bus is all the information about everything that's going on with that tool, with the custom fields, the events, everything that's, that's happening. And so in the context of wherever you, wherever you are when those events fire, you, you get the data you need to make decisions, make changes, updates, or remove stuff, whatever and then pass it on to the next phase of the, of the script. So right now, this on initialize, this is right before the user sees the UI load. So we, we get a reference to that drop down list for custom field, the one where I selected the first value. And then we, here I'm just doing a simple array. I'm just, I got some static values popped in array, so nothing fancy. Uh, and I set the data source property for that parameter. And the data source is what is used to populate that field. Now this could also be like, you know, sim call, uh, WMI call, could be a query to a database, a LDAP query, any, anything you could do with a script normally, uh, you can do it in these event scripts uh, just like any other tool. Uh, another cool thing about this is um, every tool in System Frontier runs in the context of like a service account or, or, or another account. It never runs in the context of the user who runs the tool. So I could have the tool itself when, it, when the user passes in all the information or even if you make an API call, that runs as one account but maybe this on initialize uh, tool or one of the events, they could run in other security contexts. So maybe I have a drop down that needs different credentials to talk to this database, and then maybe a table further down the form that needs another set of credentials to talk to uh, you know, a, a domain controller in a completely separate domain behind a firewall. You can set all those things up within System Frontier and it's transparent to the end user. They don't know anything about the multiple credentials or how that's configured. And you, as the uh, script writer and the tool maker, uh, it's super easy for you to set that up. You don't have to configure a bunch of config files and all that. So as the tool maker, does this plug into like source control at all? Or? Yeah, actually. Um, so, you know, I'd like rather have a pull request on this. I'm going to get some of the, you know, the equivalent of admin rights. Like I don't want to be formatted default. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, how do you, how do you so go over to the versions tab. We've got a few version components. Uh, control providers that we're going to support out of the box for the um, GA release. So GitHub Enterprise, GitHub, GitLab. So you would just select like which one you want to use. You'd put in your project URL. Um, if you don't uh, put in a branch, it's going to default to the main one. And then you would specify what credentials or API token you want to use to connect to, uh, to that repo. And so then you can work in you know, VS Code or you know, Primal Script, which I like to use, uh, whatever you want check your stuff in the source code, and then sync it to System Frontier. And you can either do that manually, or you can set up a schedule so it automatically syncs, or on a schedule, or you know, however you want to do it. When do you think this report DevOps? I'm sorry, what? Is there DevOps? Probably soon after release. It's really based, anything past these is based off of customer demand. C customer demand. We've got tons of customers that want, you know, obviously want GitHub, GitHub support, and a lot that want GitLab. Uh, haven't had, I haven't, can't even think of requests for TFS, but I have heard that, here, not TFS, I'm sorry, Azure DevOps. I've heard several people here this week asking about it. So that's probably something we'll put on the, the roadmap for a, a feature pretty soon. Uh, and I think we're, we're probably also going to, at some point, uh, make th that provider configuration like a plug-in. So like, we, we may release these five different source control providers, but you're using some, you know, some custom uh, source control provider somewhere where we'll give you uh, the plug-in architecture to do it and you can build your own and just import it. So things, you know, things like that to make the product more extensible. Yeah. All right, so looking back at this uh, source code again real quick. So this is, like I said, really simple, nothing complicated, and that's by design. So here we just we got a straight array that we're populating. But let's say I've got like um, this text file that's uh, CSV. Uh, and I want to use that to populate data. So I just do a basic import CSV on it, right? And it's located in the same folder as that. So 
I populate the data source. That's going to be used to populate that drop-down list. Um, and then, you know, once I've got that on the data bus, it automatically gets uh, used uh, by the form. So if I save that, save my tool, and then go back and run it, uh, you'll see now this device menu, which is not devices anymore, now it's showing these, uh, uh, these entries that were in the CSV file. So maybe imagine if these were like job codes or, you know, job ID, something like that. And again, uh, it's, that's a text file, but it could, instead of a text file, it could be a database query or an API query to your HR system, you know, Lawson or whatever you're using. So that way, whenever somebody's, you know, creating a new user or maybe they're transferring a user or maybe they're doing, you know, some, some HR tasks that you want to allow the HR folks to be able to do, um, they're getting live data from ac the actual data source where it's coming from instead of some static, you know, configuration that is going to be out of date as soon as it's put down. Let's see now, so that's, uh, and so, like I said, you've got the different event models, so like the on change, which is, is for that one, uh, or the on initialize, and then you've got the on change. They both follow the same format. So if I go back and look at um, the on change one, so it's in foo PS1, which is my favorite. Um, same thing here, we're just doing something different. So we've got a, a reference to the, uh, the data bus that's automatically available for us. And so here we've got this property called, a, or this object called event source. And so that's saying this is the, the, field, the custom field on the form that somebody clicked that caused this event to fire, this on change event. And so the, and the thing that I'm going to ch change, the target param here, is that next drop down list, that drop down list five. So I've got references to those, and I'm basically saying, okay, if they select one of these values, then do something. So, like, when I select the processes, um, I just did a get same instance call, pull back the processes, and just selected the first 10. Now, and you'll notice here I selected these two properties. So the System Frontier does a lot of stuff for you where you don't have to like do a lot of configuration. So I selected process ID, name, and so for a drop down list, the first property that you select is going to automatically be the value that uh, it gets used when a user selects it. The second property is going to be what's displayed in it. But now, if I, I can't even think of what some other, pro anybody can think of some other properties of process? Uh, handles. File, you think file pair? File pair. Okay, pair. But handles is one of them? Okay. We'll see how that works. Hopefully, we won't blow up here. But so, <laughs> so I'm selecting you know multiple properties, right? And so, and then once I get that data, then you'll see target parameter two. That's that second drop down that you didn't see at first. Then I just set it to visible. So it's super simple. I'm just saying, hey, once the user selects this, then go get do something, get some data, and then sh and use that to populate this next uh, drop down list and show it. All right. So let me save this. Save my tool. Uh, oh, oh, let me switch the, the data source back to the, um, the original one. Uh, sorry. Go back to my on initialize. Uh, so instead of those that CSV file, I'm going to use this uh, little array that we're testing with. I'm going to select processes again, and you'll see, I still see the list of processes, right? Because, and you remember, that first property is going to be, it was like the process ID, the second was the name, so that the name is what I'm seeing in the drop down. But let's say, you know, my users are running these tools, and they're like, you know what, I, I need more information about the processes that I'm selecting, like, can you change that? Well, you don't have to go back and, like, write a bunch of code to do that. Um, I'll just go back, configure the custom field for that drop down. And so instead of a drop down list, let's say, well, I'd rather that be a table. So I'm just going to change it to a table type, data type. Go back and run the tool again. Uh, 
select processes. Now I got a table. I didn't have to, you know, like I said, write any code to do that. Uh, since Frontier takes care of rendering that UI for me, so I can focus on the script code and not have to deal with UI stuff so much. So here, you know, by default, this lets you select a row, and so like I say, I select 736 or whatever that that PID would get passed to the script when I run it. Um, you can even do things like, like I said, uh, um, file uploads. So let's say I, I needed to do something here, like um, let's say we were doing that that uh, create user thing. Let's say I'm gonna we're gonna add Gary Coleman to the HR list. Hopefully I can do. Uh -oh. Can I drag a file? Oh man. It work for this? It works for this every time except now. That's, you know? <laughs> it's just, this is awesome, dude. I'm loving it. <laughs> dude. Man. Yeah, okay. At the risk of exposing something on the recording, hopefully, let's see here. All right, so I can hit upload, and let's see, let me pop in a name again. Now, again, I'm putting in like, this particular tool would be, is targeting a host name, right? Uh, let's say I needed to run this on like a thousand systems. I could paste in those in, those in here, and it's going to, like I said, multi-thread across those and handle that for me. Like, I don't have to write in like for each parallel or anything like that in my script. As long as my script can do you know, like one unit of work, then System Frontier is going to take and scale that out for me. Um, so here, let me. Uh, so it, there's some default settings that it uh, that are set for you, but then you can go in and configure it. So by default, it's maybe like. 20 threads a uh, core or something like that. I, I can't remember the exact default. Uh, but you can go in and kind of adjust those numbers to what makes sense for you. And the Is that per tool or per? Uh, per execution host. So every, every tool actually runs on uh, uh, execution host, which is configured in System Frontier. And, so, and then you can scale those out as well. So let's say, like, we've got customers that, you know, have, like, uh, sites in different regional locations, different countries, behind firewalls. Uh, PC enclaves, things like that. You can take execution hosts, put them in those environments closer to what they're managing, and then configure it here. And so, based off of uh, where that resource is located, System Frontier will make sure it runs on the correct uh, execution host. And so, however you configure it, you configure it in the app. And, and so that's another, that's a good point. Another thing to note is everything in System Frontier, the role-based access control model, the topology. Um, the, um, you know, all the, the tools, the configuration, everything is self-contained within the product so that, and, and the benefit to that is there's no vendor lock-in, right? So you could set up permissions for, you know, thousands of users and all kind of complex configurations to manage all kinds of things. Nothing ever changes, physically changes in your environment to make that happen. It's all stored in the database. So there's no GPOs that are getting pushed out. Uh, there's no like SDDO, you know, permission strings that are getting changed physically on services or anything like that. Um, you use the product for a few years and you're like, you know what, System Frontier sucks. We're moving on to PowerShell Universal or something else, you know. Uh, you shut us down and move on and you st all your scripts are just standard scripts. There's nothing like proprietary about it. So you can, you know, keep them where they are and move them to something else. You know, we don't, we don't try to lock you in like that. So yeah, you, you got a lot of options as far as the way you can configure stuff. Our, our, stance is, oops, our stance is we want to give you the tools to uh, configure and run things the way you want uh, and not dictate the way it happens. Where we dictate a lot is just as far as the UI. We, we make the UI very simple and easy on purpose, and that's for uh, less overhead for you as an admin and uh, ease of use for your end users. Uh, they could be running tools to manage all types of different things, different environments. And their interface is really easy to learn. It's, uh, uh, you know, recognizable. They, they know how it works. Yeah. So let's run this. Hopefully this doesn't blow up too. All right, let's see if we added Gary Coleman. Yep, yep, he's in there. So 
Now, the reason I'm showing this is uh, that file upload, along with everything else that we do with custom fields, you, all of that is stored on that data bus that I talked about, which is passed to this each, each part of the workflow. So the script that actually ran, you see like the, the standard you know, shell output that you would normally see here. Well, you, I've actually got access to the raw file data on the data bus. So I was able to turn around and render that in HTML so I could display it to the user. Right? Well, I could also do things like say, uh, let's say I've got um, you know, a team in another country behind a couple of firewalls. Uh, there's no way I can do like SMB file transfers to them, right? They're in a totally different domain, untrusted. Well, I could set up a System Frontier execution host on the other side of the firewall on their network, configure it in System Frontier, have a form here that says, hey, I, I need to upload these HR files to that team. You upload it and have, you can have your tool do a file transfer through the System Frontier, pro, uh, not protocol, but the, the network over a single TCP port through the firewall. And so you don't have to go engage the firewall team, set up rules or whatever. As long as you've already got a rule in place for System Frontier to do management tasks, then you can make all that happen just from PowerShell. Or again, any other script language you want to use. Yeah. Yeah. It defaults to like 48,500, but you can configure it to whatever you want. And it's TCP traffic. We use certificate authentication. And it, it scales. I mean, we've got you know, pretty large customers uh, scaling out with you know, large networks and large topologies. So. The, uh, when, the, when the user runs this tool, mm -hmm. uh, how would it, do they see that same interface? Or is there, because there might be some things there that are appropriate to an admin that you don't necessarily want a user poking their fingers at. Exactly. I'm going to leave Gary up while we talk about that. Um, yeah, so keep in mind, everything in System Frontier is role-based, right? So end user, admins, I'll keep doing that. We all hit the same UI but we see different things based off of the roles we have. So as a, let's say, a help desk user, I may see a tenth of what is on the screen that an admin would see because I haven't been delegated access to all that. And so you can even, in, in the 2.0 version, you can even do things like hide the menu. So like, instead of like, um, you know, pulling up a, this tool list and having a menu over here, you could have like, like a tile-based view. And so I might be, I might support, you know, one application in the enterprise and you, you know, out of you know, 100 tools, you've given me three tools to do three specific things. And when I pull up the interface, I just see those three tools, and that's it. So I'm not bogged down with a bunch of stuff that I can't do or don't need to worry about. And then even with those, diff those three tools, let's say uh, one tool might you know, do some management on some SQL servers somewhere. Another tool might do some management on some web servers somewhere. You can set up tool access uh, not just to run the tool, but what it can run against. So, and I'll, sh I'll show you what that looks like real quick. Are we, are we doing okay on time or? Okay, all right. So if we go to settings uh, down here and go to roles. So I've just got a couple roles in here, but you can have you know, whatever you want. Uh, I click on a role and it's really basic configuration. I got members, I could add users, groups in here. Um, I could add users from different domains or local users that support uh, uh, token-based authentication. Um, so I would add users to a role or add a group to a role. Whenever they hit the portal the first time, if they're in a group that matches the role, they'll automatically get provision with the right access and system frontier. Um, and then I go to permissions to determine what this role can do. So like right now, let's say this role can read, you know, secrets. Uh, and maybe just specific, like in this case, if I go to targets. So let me take a step back. So the few things to note here, you've got action, resource, filter, and targets, right? So action is kind of, you think about like action and resource like verb noun and, and PowerShell. So action is I can read, and then what, what can I read a secret, right? Uh, filter is a way to do uh, filtering syntax to kind of like narrow down stuff based off of like wild cards or whatever else. So I could say, okay, you could read any secret where, um, you know, the date hasn't expired and the name has, you know, John in it or something using wild cards. You can, you can kind of get, you know, very granular with that. Targets are what does this actually apply to? Like, so if I click on targets, here they can, this role, role B can read this GitLab test secret. Um, maybe it's something like, uh, I need to, them to manage services on a box. So I'll go to new. Here I've got a list of different actions I can provide. So I can just give somebody read access, I can give them modify access, start, stop, different things. I've got full control over that. 
So let's say in the case, or let's say like a custom tool. Let's say I want to start, and then here's all the different um, objects that you can apply permissions to. So I'm going to say I want them to somebody to be able to start a custom tool. Well, I've been in this case, I don't know if you guys, but where we've had contractors come in and do a project for six months. They leave. A year later, we're like, hey, did we remove their access? Okay, let's go you know, clean it up. Uh, here you can actually set like expiration date on permissions. So you can say, all right, well, these perms are going to automatically expire on this date. So to apply that, so now they've got the start custom tool permission. If I don't add anything, that means they can start any tool, right? But I want to click on targets, and I'm going to go, let's search for that uh, basic test tool we've, we've been working with. So here I could select that and, I was, and uh, hit add, apply, and then now, you know, anybody in this role B, they can start just that one specific tool, right? And so I can also scope that to, like I said, different systems or whatever, you know, however you want to. So you, you've got a lot of options in how you can kind of slice and dice permit roles and permissions to make sure you're only giving people, the right people, the right level of access that you want them to have. All right, so let's see. Let me go back to again. So I talked about, you know, each tool runs in a, its own security context. So you click on the security tab and you select whatever credentials you want that tool to run as. Um, if you don't select anything here and it's uh, one of the objects, that, object types in your system frontier like uh, server, workstation, user account or whatever, you can have it set up. We've got these collections. So you could set up a, a collection to where, let's say, you know, there's a bunch of servers in that collection. You can set up credentials on that collection. So that basically any time I manage anything in this collection, it's going to use whatever credentials I've, I've specified for it. So let's say a tool is targeting that collection. If I don't specify creds on the tool, it's going to resolve to whatever the targets are in. So if the targets are in that collection, it sees a credential for it, it'll use those automatically. Me as the tool designer, I don't have to know the ins and outs of that. Some of the benefits of that is, let's say, you know, let's say I need to add a, a win server to entry on you know, 5,000 machines. And they're all over the place, right? And maybe they're in like 10 different collections. Well, for some reason, maybe several of those collections have different uh, credentials configured on them. My tool doesn't have to know anything about that. I just don't set credentials on the tool. It'll automatically resolve the right credentials on all those systems. Again, multi-thread that all. And, and you know, it just kind of happens transparently in the background. Is that making sense so far? Any questions? or? All right, and then uh, one other thing I, I want to show you real quick. Um, so I know back when I was you know, working for you know corporate companies, you would get all the time like, why are you working on this script? Why are you automating this? Why are you trying to do X, Y, Z? How is this helping us? And so you know, in, in a lot of cases, people aren't doing centralized logging. They're not doing any type of telemetry, things like that. So you have to go back and try to figure out, okay, what. What have I done? How is this impacting the company? How am I helping? Well, with System Frontier, the more tools you put in the product, uh, the, the more they get run, you can set up this automatic ROI. So we have this feature in the current version, had it for a couple years now, and it's really been a huge uh, success with customers because what it does is, as an admin, uh, every time I create a tool or all the people that are creating tools in the product, you can go in and say, okay, on average, um, if, if a human does this process, how long is it going to take on average? And so then you would put that into, the, into this configuration setting here. And so every time that tool is run, all this uh, data is going to be automatically crunched in the background and it will generate ROI reports. They're strictly based off of labor savings, but that's, that's a good chunk of data. So we're not even talking about the security benefits like um, reducing risk, things like that, just from a labor standpoint. And so then that report, and I, again, this is early beta, so I don't have the report to show you right now, but um, that report you can then delegate out to your manager or your director or whoever. So they can go just pull it up a dashboard and see, hey, uh, System Frontier, the automation in it is saving us this amount of money every week, every month, throughout the you know, year to date, whatever. And so that's, that's great for you as an admin because then it makes it so much easier for you to prove the, the value that you're bringing to your organization through automation. Um, you don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops and try to figure it out. Now, if you're already doing like centralized logging, telemetry and stuff like that, awesome, right? But a lot of people aren't. A lot of people aren't. This just makes it, 
it's easier to do that. So, and then just kind of circling back to the, the whole point of this talk is, you know, when you take your scripts and turn them into these tools like this, it makes it super easy for you to do it. And so um, your, your, your time to, to market, if you will, is a lot faster than you trying to build a GUI on your own, trying to break out, you know, Visual Studio and hand, hand code a, a form or something like that. You also don't have to worry about sending that out to somebody, them running on their desktop or share, them having to have credentials to do it, or if it's just a straight script, worrying about, okay, is, you know, John Doe, uh, if I want John Doe in accounting to be able to, like, restart a service on one of the financial servers just, you know, at 3 a.m. and not bother us, I don't want him to have to have admin rights or be able to modify the script. You know, you can, you can package these tools up, give them that functionality, they can do it themselves. You could even do things like in the script in the background, once they do that action, it's good, go update a ticket automatically or create a ticket, take the results, dump it into the ticket. So now you've got metrics on the back end, not only from our, an ROI perspective, but from whatever your ticketing system is, however you're tracking things today. And so that, that's going to empower other teams to do more without having to have the keys to the kingdom, and it's going to free you and your team up to be able to do more and not, not have to focus on those tasks. So, what, what questions you guys have? Feedback? I know we're all close to out of time, so, yeah. I was hoping you could show an example of the uh, RESTful API endpoint that's created by the not, not in this beta version, but um, there's, we've got videos. If you go to systemfrontier.com, we've got videos of the current product, how to use the REST API, and it's, it's dead simple. Uh, literally, uh, I'll, the example I like to use is, uh, Again, it's not just PowerShell. I could take a batch file that I wrote back in, you know, 97, import it into the product, and the, minute I, uh, the moment I hit the Save button, I've got a REST API, I've got a web interface, I've got role-based access control, I've got automa uh, automated, uh, audit, automated logging, so who ran it, when they, when they ran it, what it did, what the output was, all that. All those things are wrapped up in there. And so, like, the REST API, you, the, you, you set up some, like, a, a hash table of parameters that match the parameters in your in your script and on your form, uh, you pass in the values, pass that to like an invoke REST method call. Uh, you pass in, so you see this GUID up here in the, in the URL. Every tool has a specific GUID. You pass that in, that GUID in so you know which tool you're running, and that's it. It's, I mean, you can have it in like five or ten lines. And like I said, we've got some videos out there. Uh, Josh, we had a video with Josh King uh, on the site, and then there's some other videos too, and then documentation on it. It's, it's super simple. And the API in the new version will be very similar, but way more robust. There's, a, like, there's like a limited set of things you can do in the current version. The new 2.0 version, you've got access to everything under the hood. So you can, there's just a lot more functionality that you, that you can use, but not that you have to. Again, our design is simplicity first, and then give you the ability to get more complex with it, but not make it a requirement. So. Not, not yet, and we, we've been kind of researching that. I've had a lot of customers ask about that. But the way, the way we execute tools, are, since they're in the context of a, an, a server or an, an account, they need basically like log on uh, local permissions to actually do that on the execution host. So yeah, we. we yeah, I guess. Yeah, and like, um, like, and as far as like the execution of the scripts, like I said, they run on the execution host, not on the target. But if you're using like WinRM or whatever in your script, we don't dictate what you do in your script. We just give you the ability to run it. So you could do uh, Windows remoting or whatever. I'm doing a talk tomorrow on an open source script called WMI Exec. It's like, a, like if you want to go back in time and use WMI to execute stuff remotely and get the output back. It's not something I recommend today. It's just kind of a novel approach that I uh, came up with. So. But yeah, you could do all that stuff with System Frontier. Um, yep. What other questions you guys have? Right. Well, cool. Well, I won't uh, we'll let you go early. I appreciate everybody's uh, time and attention. And uh, thanks for checking out the brand new version of System Frontier.